Today in the workshop, we're working with GPS modules. We'll see how satellite positioning systems work and how we can use a variety of modules with an Arduino and Raspberry Pi. We'll also build a GPS logger to find out where we've traveled. We're in the right position today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and today we are going to be working with a number of GPS modules. In actual fact, what we're really working with is satellite positioning systems because GPS is not the only positioning system, it's just the most well-known one. But we can take advantage of signals from a number of different satellites in order to find out exactly where we are. Now, GPS itself really doesn't need any introduction. It started off as a military-only system, then it branched into avionics and marine applications, but now it is used as a consumer application for virtually everything. We have GPS devices in our vehicles, we've got them in our phones and in our tablets, and model aircraft and quadcopter enthusiasts have them in their devices as well, and we can use them in our own projects. So let's start off by finding out how satellite positioning systems work, and then we'll see how we can work with these amazing little modules. These systems provide geospatial positioning using data from multiple satellites. The satellites broadcast precision time references. These time references are provided by onboard cesium atomic clocks for incredible accuracy. Most positioning satellites reside in medium Earth orbit, meaning that they orbit the Earth twice per day. There are six current positioning systems, four of them global and two regional ones. The American Global Positioning System, or GPS, is by far the most used and most well-known of the positioning systems. The first GPS launch occurred in 1978, but the system was restricted for military use only then. Although the system was opened up to maritime and aviation use by President Ronald Reagan, commercial use didn't really start until 1994. The GPS system employs up to 32 satellites, 31 currently are in use. Satellites are often replaced in order to improve their technology. GPS satellites orbit at an altitude of 20,180 kilometers. The second most popular positioning system is the Russian Global Navigation Satellite System. The first launch occurred in 1982, and it was available for global use in 1995. GLONASS uses 24 satellites, and they orbit at an altitude of 19,130 kilometers. The Beidou Navigational Satellite System is a product of the People's Republic of China. The first launch occurred in the year 2000. Global operation was achieved in 2018, and the final deployment of BDU-2, which replaced the older BDU-1, occurred in 2020. This is a very advanced system that consists of 30 medium orbit satellites plus 5 geostationary satellites. The medium orbit satellites orbit at an altitude of 21,150 kilometers. The most recent global positioning system is the European Space Agency's Galileo positioning system. The first launch of Galileo occurred in 2011, and global operation was achieved in 2014. Galileo consists of 30 satellites, and they orbit at an altitude of 23,222 kilometers. Galileo was designed to be completely compatible with GPS, so the two systems can enhance each other. There are also two regional positioning systems. NAVIC is the Navigation with Indian Constellation System. It currently consists of seven satellites, but will eventually consist of 11. NAVIC was launched in 2018, and the Indian government has indicated that they will eventually turn this into a global positioning system. The Japanese Quasi-Zenith Satellite System operates on a slightly different principle in that it uses both ground stations and satellites. 
Currently it consists of only one satellite, but eventually will be expanded to seven. The satellite was launched in 2010, but did not become operational until 2018. Positioning systems work on the principle of triangulation, which you're probably familiar with. If we have a person at point A and two known reference points at B and C, we can determine the person's position knowing the distance between B and C, A and B, and A and C. If our person were to move, those distances would change and their position could be easily calculated. However, we live in a three-dimensional world and simple triangulation is not enough to determine our position. We also need to be able to determine altitude. For this, we need signals from multiple satellites, which will allow us to determine position, altitude, and also velocity. We require a minimum of four satellites for accuracy. Three of the satellites will be used to provide the X, Y, and Z coordinates. An additional satellite is used to provide a clock reference. It should be noted that some GPS systems used for maritime and aviation use also make use of ground-based stations as well. Two types of systems that do this are assisted GPS or differential GPS. A GPS receiver first consists of an antenna. This can be a very sophisticated and large device or it can be etched onto a printed circuit board. The output of the antenna is passed to a filter to filter out extraneous signals and just get the satellite signals. The multiple satellite signals are combined into a decoder, which will determine the actual position. The decoder is then fed into an output device to display the position. Most GPS systems use a comma delimited ASCII text standard called NEMA 0183. The GPS data is generally updated at a rate of once per second, but some advanced systems can operate at up to 20 times per second. Each comma delimited line is called a sentence, and you can break down the sentence in order to get the GPS data that you're interested in. You can get the time, the longitude, the latitude, the number of satellites that are visible, and the altitude from the NEMA 0183 serial data stream. Because they use comma delimited serial data, GPS units can easily be connected to a computer for data processing. They can also, of course, be connected to a microcontroller, which is what we'll be doing today. So let's take a look at a few GPS units now. So here are a couple of GPS units, some of which we're going to be using today. The first one over here is the Betain BN-180 GPS. This is a very inexpensive and very basic GPS, but if all you're looking for is simple positioning function, then this one will certainly do. The BN-220 that is next to it has pretty well the same performance specs, except this also has a built-in flash memory. And the BN-880 over here has the flash memory, it has the GPS, it's a more sensitive GPS, and it also has an electronic compass or magnetometer inside it that you can use. So you'll notice it has more output pins than these two over here. Now this is the Adafruit Ultimate GPS. It's a very high quality GPS. It can get a lot of different satellite channels. It has provisions for an external antenna as well as its built-in antenna. And finally this spark fun you Unit on the end I just wanted to show you we won't really be using it today but I will be using it in a future video this is a very advanced GPS unit that can also do RTK which is real-time kinetics and that allows you to use a second source to get some incredible accuracy to give you an idea of the accuracy all of these other GPS units the standard ones will get you accurate between one and three meters by using this with what is called an NTRIP source which gives you a positioning reference source you can actually get accuracy down 
to one centimeter on these and you can get accuracy down to one tenth of a millimeter of positioning so this is an incredibly accurate GPS now let's give you an idea of some of the cost differences talking in US dollars this unit over here is about a ten dollar unit and this is about a twelve dollar unit the BN 880 goes for about 20 US dollars the Adafruit Ultimate GPS goes for about 40 US dollars and this spark fun unit over here goes for 275 US dollars and while that may seem a lot GPS's with RTK capability were rarely seen under a thousand dollars so this is actually quite a bargain but we won't be focusing on this device today but we will be using the other devices that you see here so now that we understand how satellite positioning systems work and that we've looked at a couple of GPS modules, it's time, of course, to start using those modules. Now, I'm going to be using the BN220, but you could use pretty well any GPS module that outputs serial data. And so let's go ahead and get out an Arduino Uno and start working with these modules. For our first GPS experiments, we'll need an Arduino. I'm using an Arduino Uno, but any Arduino should suffice. And the GPS unit with a serial output. Now I'm showing a Betane BN-180, but pretty well any GPS unit will work. We'll start by connecting digital I.O. pin 3 to the GPS's TX or transmit pin. I.O. pin 4 on the Arduino will be connected to the GPS's RX or receive input. The 5 volt output from the Arduino will be connected to the VCC on the GPS module, and the ground from the Arduino will be connected to the GPS ground. And that's it for the wiring. Now let's take a look at some code we can use to make use of it. Now when we use our GPS units with an Arduino Uno, we are going to be using a software serial port. This is because the Uno only has one serial connection, and we need that for the USB port. The software serial library is built into your Arduino IDE, so you don't need to install it, and it allows you to use any two data pins as a transmit and receive, and it emulates a serial port in software. Now this first sketch that we're going to look at is actually a general purpose sketch that you could use with other devices aside from GPS's, anything that uses the software serial. And it simply reflects the data on the software serial port to the serial port so we can read it on the serial monitor. Now the sketch is very simple. We'll start off by defining the connections that we're using for transmit and receive from the GPS. So the transmit from the GPS is the receive on the Arduino and vice versa. And that's on pins three and four. And you could move those to two other pins if you wanted to. The next thing we have is the baud rate on the software serial port. Now most GPSs have a range of baud rates, but the two most common ones are 4800 and 9600 we're going to be using 9600 baud. We're also setting up the baud for our serial monitor and notice that we're using 115200 and not the slower 96. This is so we don't drop off any data when we're reading it. Then we go and include the software serial library and we set that software serial library up. We create an object called GPS serial to represent that software serial port and we pass it the two pins we're using for the receive and transmit. In the setup, we'll set up our serial monitor and we'll also start the software serial. And the loop is very simple. As long as there is data available on the software serial, we will just write that to the serial port. So it's a very simple sketch. Now I've got my GPS hooked up, so let's open the serial monitor and take a look at the data that we're getting. Now remember, I'm indoors right now, so this data is going to be garbage data. But as you can see, we are receiving data from our GPS. And if you look at the GPS unit, it is flashing, and it flashes every time that it transmits data. Now, if you don't get anything back from this, you'll have to check your connections, and the most likely connection error will be reversing transmit and receive. So just try swapping those two lines, and you should get data. Now, as I said, this is garbage data, but I'm going to take this outside now and run it where I can pick up some satellites, and we'll take a look at the data we get there. 
And so I've taken the unit outside, and as you can see, I'm getting a bunch of NEMA sentences out of it, which is what I would expect, so it's locked onto some satellites. Now, to decode these sentences, you can use the chart that I've got over here. It tells you what type of different sentences we have. And you can certainly use an online utility to go and break down the sentences and get the data you need out of it. But there is a simpler way of doing that, and the simpler way of doing that is just simply to use a library. There are a number of libraries for the Arduino that will allow you to take NEMA sentences and decode them and extract the data that you actually want to get, such as longitude, latitude, and time, etc. So we're going to take a look now at a couple of libraries that will let you go ahead and do exactly that. Now, in order to make some sense out of that GPS data, there are a number of libraries that we can use to parse the data and turn it into more usable results. Now, one of the more common ones is called the Tiny GPS Library. And if you open up your library manager, you can go and grab that directly from there. So just go in and filter by Tiny GPS. And there it is right now, Tiny GPS. And we can just hit the installation button over here and it's installed. Now Tiny GPS is a nice library and I'll show you a few of the things that it has. We can go down to the examples and scroll down to the examples from custom libraries where we should be seeing Tiny GPS. And we've got a simple test, a static test, which basically doesn't require a GPS, it just has some preset data in it, and a test with a GPS device. And this basic library can be used for a lot of applications. But I found another library that I think is nicer, and it's called Tiny GPS++. And you can't get it on the library manager yet, excuse me, it's right over here. Now this is on GitHub, you can go and grab this. So grab the source code in a zip file and then go and download that. And once you've done that, you'll need to install that into your Arduino IDE. So go under Sketch, go into Include Library, and then go into Add Zip Library and go into where you've downloaded it, in my case my downloads folder, and there it is, Tiny GPS Plus, and we'll just install that. And now we can go and take a look at the examples that we get in the Tiny GPS Plus Plus library, which are much more extensive. As you can see, there are quite a few libraries, uh, sorry, examples in this library. The basic example, device example, full example, kitchen sink. Let's go and take a look at the full example. Now the full example is pretty cool. It prints out pretty well every piece of data from the GPS that you'd want to see. Plus it also amusingly prints out your distance to London. And so this shows you what you're going to start getting, the degree and longitude, latitude, the date, the time, the altitude, etc., the course speed if you happen to be moving and not stationary, and also the distance from London. And here's a uh, here's just a look at the code inside here. As you can see, it pretty well the library takes care of everything. So you can get the number of satellites from satellite values. You can uh, get the location, age. You can get the date and time right from the GPS object. So the library pretty well does everything for you. The rest of the code essentially is functions that format the numbers. So down over here, for example, a print of the float. Down here, print integers, print date, time. It just formats the data so that it looks nice. And up over here, um, the amusing print distance in kilometers to London, and it actually gives you the longitude and latitude for London in order to do that. So I'm going to run this, but of course if I run it right now on my GPS, we're probably not going to get some wonderful results. Just let me make certain that I've actually got my port set up and my board. I do indeed, so let's go and upload this. And we're done uploading and I can open up my serial monitor and as you can see I'm getting absolutely no data let's just make that a little wider so we can see all the different things we have because of course my GPS although it's blinking here merrily away is indoors and it's not picking anything up so let's move this outside and see what the results are using the tiny GPS++ library 
And so we've taken it back outside, and as you can see, the date is a lot easier to read. It's separated out longitude, latitude, the date and the time, and even such statistics as the distance to my place from London. So by using a library, we can interpret those NEMA sentences and get much more meaningful data for our GPS projects. The Betain BN880 module has not only a GPS sensor in it, but also a magnetometer or a compass. And this module is intended for use primarily in things like model airplanes and quadcopters, where you don't only want to know where you are, but you also want to know what direction you are pointed in. And of course, we can use that capabilities in our experiments as well. So let's go and take a look at how we get the compass data out of the B10BN880 BN module. Now for this experiment, we're going to require an Arduino Uno and a BTAIN BN880 GPS unit. Now when I do the hookup diagram, please do not look at the colors of the wiring I'm using. Instead, look at the order of the connections on the BTAIN BN880. The B10880 will probably come with a connection cable you can use, but the colors on those cables vary dramatically. So starting from left to right on the BTAIN unit, we'll connect the SDA connection to analog input A4 on the Arduino. The next connection is the ground, and that will be connected to the Arduino's ground. The third connection is the TX from the BN880, and that will be connected to Arduino data pin 4. The RX from the BN880 will be connected to Arduino data pin 3. The next connection is the VCC, and that will be connected to the Arduino's 5 volt output. And the final connection on the right is the SCL connection, and that will be connected to the Arduino's A5 connection. Note that I didn't use any pull-up resistors in this, as I found that the internal 30K resistors that the Arduino has for I2C were sufficient. However, if you have difficulty getting the compass readings, you might want to throw a couple of 4.7K pull-up resistors on lines A4 and A5. And this completes our wiring. Let's go and take a look at some code we can use with the BN880 GPS. Now the BN880 GPS unit also has a built-in magnetometer in it. Now you can use the GPS section exactly as you did with the previous GPS modules. So either the Tiny GPS or Tiny GPS++ or another GPS library can be used to get the results for it. For the magnetometer, you're going to need to install another library. Now the magnetometer is an HMC5883. I've already installed the library, but let me show you where it is. You just go into Manage Libraries and then type in HMC5883 and you will get this Adafruit library, the HMC5883 Unified Library, which I've already installed. Now when you go to install this library, you may be prompted to install some dependent libraries as well because this is part of the Adafruit Unified Sensor series of libraries and they rely on a master library to be existing as well as this library. So go ahead and tell it to install all of the libraries and once you do you can go into the examples and there only is one example called Mag Sensor and this is an example that works with a magnetometer. Now you can run this pretty well as it is. The actual code again is made simple because the library does pretty well everything so it gives you the X Y and Z coordinates of the magnetometer but one thing you will want to do if you want accurate readings is you'll need to calibrate it for your location the magnetic North Pole of course is not the same as the true North Pole and so there'll be a magnetic deviation or declination in your area and that will be unique to where you live now they have an example of zero point 0.22 radians over here and you can calculate yours by going down to a site in which you first of all measure the actual magnetic declination and I've got mine over here it's negative 14.2 which is very close to where they used the example and that makes a lot of sense because Adafruit is based in New York City and their magnetic declination is very similar to ours here in Montreal now you'll need to convert that unit to uh, 
uh, it, that's in degrees and minutes, and you're going to need to convert it to a decimal form. So you need to just change the minutes into a decimal, which I've done over here. So I've got negative 14.03392, etc., etc. And it comes out to negative 024 radians. And so as you can see, that's very close to the example they have here of 22. I'm just going to leave this alone right now because I'm not looking for particularly precision results. But what I'm going to do is load this and observe the results in the serial monitor as I move the unit around. Okay, I've got it running right now. As you can see, I'm getting readings through the X, Y, and Z axis and the heading in degrees. And if I move this around, you can see that I can change all of those figures, move it onto different angles, and you can watch the different axes change value as well as the degree heading when I've got it facing up like this. And so it does indeed seem to give different readings as I'm moving around and demonstrates the use of the magnetometer or compass function of the BN880 GPS module. Now the module that we're going to take a look at next is the Adafruit Ultimate GPS module. And this module is actually available in two different configurations. It's available in a configuration with a USB output, which is the module that I have, or it is also available with a discrete output that you could use in a similar fashion to the modules we already looked at. Because it has a USB output, it is more suited for things like computers or microcomputers. And so instead of using an Arduino for these experiments, we're going to be using a Raspberry Pi for them. So let's go and take a look at the Adafruit Ultimate GPS module and how we can use it with a Raspberry Pi. Now this is the Adafruit Ultimate GPS, the USB version, and as you can see it's got a USB connector right on the end over here, a micro USB. It's also got a place for four pins over here, but those are just a repeat of the four connections on the USB, so this is not as easy to directly connect to an Arduino, but for a microcomputer or a computer this is ideal. Another neat thing about this is that you can use it two ways. You can use it just standalone, or you can connect an external antenna to it, which is what I'm doing. Now it's got a connection down over here called the UFL connection, and I've got a little adapter cable on it to adapt it to an SMA connection, and this is going to allow me to use this inside the workshop with an antenna outdoors. Now because my workshop is a great distance from the uh, window in the basement, in fact it's the opposite corner, I need a number of things to do this. So first of all, this is my antenna over here. It's uh, a very basic antenna. You'll find these things relatively inexpensive. I got this one at Spark Fun, and it's actually an amplified device, and it comes with about three meters of SMA cable, and you can see the SMA adapter I have over here. Now this antenna needs to be placed down onto a metallic surface, and it's actually magnetic, so I've got this plate over here that also came from Spark Fun, and the plate has on the bottom of it a thread that can go onto a tripod thread, so that's what I'll be using in the backyard. Now in order to get it to the workbench, I've created a couple of things here. Now this is another SMA extension, and I've placed this onto a piece of coroplast, which I've cut to fit into the basement window, so that I can run the antenna outside and not let all the insects inside. But even that and this are not long enough to get to where I want to go. So what I've done is I've got another extension cable over here, and this is a 3 meter extension, this is a 2 meter one here, this is about 2 meters of cable, but that's going to run in my backyard. And that will bring the Adafruit GPS pretty well down my hallway, so in order to complete the rest of the distance to the workbench, I've also got this cable over here, a micro USB cable that's about 4 meters long, so we're really going on a long distance extension run in order to work on this in the workbench, but um, 
it actually works. I was rather surprised. I was concerned that the attenuation in these cables might knock the signal down too much, but it doesn't really, and it seems to work out just fine. So now we'll see how we can use this with a Raspberry Pi here in the comfort of the workshop. And so I have my Ultimate GPS hooked up to my Raspberry Pi with an extremely long extension cord on both the USB and on the external antenna so that I can actually keep my antenna in the backyard and work on this in the workshop. So this is real remote control work over here. Now I've got a cheat sheet over here and you can get a copy of this cheat sheet on the article that accompanies this video on the dronebotworkshop.com website. And it'll make it a lot easier to enter all these commands in. And the first one I've got over here, this just lists the devices that it sees on the USB port. And what you're looking for over here is this one over here, this Signal Integrated Products Incorporated. This is actually the GPS unit. And so you'll want to do that just to make certain that you've got a connection to it. Now the next line we're going to do is going to actually install GPSD which is the client that we're going to use to display GPS data. So I'll copy that over here and I'll do a paste into my terminal and I'll just hit enter and we'll do the installation and I'll say yes I want to do this. Now after we've installed it, we have to disable and get rid of one of the services it installs because it's actually going to interfere with the operation on the Raspberry Pi. So we do it with these two commands. First of all, this one will stop the service. And the next command over here will actually disable the service in its entirety, but you have to stop it first before you can do that. Okay, now we're going to actually manually start the GPSD service with this long command line over here. And finally, we can use this final one to display and see if we're getting any results. And bear in mind, it may take a little while for the results to come in. And there we go, we're actually getting some results right now from a number of satellites, which is pretty impressive when you consider again that this antenna is in the backyard and the antenna itself has about a three meter cable on it and I've got a total of eight meters of additional SMA extension cable running to the GPS and then I've got a uh, 12 foot USB connection going to that and nonetheless we're getting good data here in our Raspberry Pi. So this is one way that you can use the Adafruit Ultimate GPS. Now the experiments we've done so far has made use of GPS data from a stationary position and that position being my backyard. But a lot of times we like to use this kind of data in order to track where we have gone. So for our last experiment, we're going to build a simple GPS tracker. We're just going to take the GPS data and format it and put it into a CSV or comma separated value file. Now you can open up a CSV file in pretty well any spreadsheet application in Microsoft Excel, in Google Sheets, or LibreOffice Calc. But you can also use a CSV file and open it up in Google Maps. And by doing that, you'll be able to track exactly where you have been with your GPS unit. So let's go and take a look at the hookup for that. And then we'll take a look at the code we need in order to make our own GPS tracker. Now here's what you're going to need in order to hook up our position logging circuit. First of all, you'll need an Arduino Uno, and you'll need a micro SD card module. The module I'm using is a very common module, and it has a built-in 5 volt regulator and level converter, so it runs on 5 volts and is 5 volt logic compatible. Of course, you'll also need a GPS module. Although I'm showing a BN180 GPS, I'm actually using a BN220 in my circuit, and any GPS module that outputs serial data will work. You'll need an LED, any color will do, and the dropping resistor for that LED. I'm using 220 ohms, but any value from 150 to 470 ohms will suffice. We'll begin by connecting the SD module. We'll connect the ground from the Arduino to the SD module's ground connection. 
We'll connect the Arduino's 5 volt output to the VCC input on the SD module. Pin 12 of the Arduino is connected to the MISO, which is master in, slave out, on the SD module. Pin 11 on the Arduino is connected to MOSI, master out, slave in. Pin 13 is connected to the clock signal on the SD module. On my module, this is labeled SCK. And pin 5 from the Arduino is connected to the chip selector CS pin on the micro SD module. Now we'll hook up the GPS in the same fashion that we did in our previous experiment. We'll connect the Arduino's ground to the GPS ground. Pin 4 of the Arduino will be connected to the GPS receive line. Arduino pin 3 will be connected to the GPS transmit line. And the Arduino's 5 volt outputs will be connected to the VCC on the GPS module. Finally, we'll connect pin 7 of the Arduino to one side of the dropping resistor. The other side of the resistor will be connected to the anode of the LED. And we'll connect the cathode of the LED to the ground connection. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go and take a look at some code we can use to build our GPS position logger. Okay, this is the sketch that we're going to be using for the position logger, and it's based around the tiny GPS library that you saw earlier. So if you haven't installed that library, remember that's the one we need to install from a zip file. It's not up in your library manager, at least not yet. After that, we just use the software serial library so we can talk to the GPS, the SPI library so we can talk to the SD card, and the SD card library itself so we can exchange data with it. And these last three libraries are all part of your Arduino IDE. We define the GPS connections and we also define the baud rate to the GPS. So if you're using a module that has a 4800 baud rate instead of 9600 or a different one, you can change that. Now this is the chip select pin for the SD or micro SD card and here's the pin that we're using to drive our LED. Now we got a string we define over here called GPS text and this is going to hold one line of GPS data which in our case is just going to be longitude, latitude, and a time stamp. Uh, then we're going to have a couple of variables for a counter because I found that if you took every single GPS reading you got too many readings and you have to remember that if you're going to try to plot this onto Google Maps you have a limit of 2,000 plots that they'll accept and that's the maximum. So you want to keep keep it down under that. And I found for walking a value over here for GPS count was pretty good at 30. Now if you're cycling or if you're going to use this on a motorcycle or something you might want to reduce this value. If you want to get more waypoints, if you want to get them spaced closer together you can reduce that value or you may even want to increase it. So experiment a bit with that. Anyway, we create an object for our GPS, call it GPS, and we set up the software serial at the pins that we defined. Then we go into the setup, uh, we'll define our LED as an output, and we'll turn on our serial monitor, and the serial monitor is just there for debugging purposes when you're getting this all to work. So it could be handy then, but of course when you're out in the field you're not going to be able to look at it unless you want to bring a computer with you. Um, after that we're going to get the software serial port going at the baud rate that we defined and then we initialize our SD or micro SD card and so if it fails we're not going to go anywhere past this point but if the card initializes we'll print out to our serial monitor and then because we're going to be out in the field and probably won't have a serial monitor I blink the LED on and off three times just to let me know I'm gone through the setup and everything is good to go. Now before I show you the loop, I want to show you the function that I call in the loop, the one that's written over here, display info. So let's go down to display info, which is down over here. And this is the function that's going to get a string of data to write out to our file. So um, as long as we have GPS data that's valid, it'll, it'll look for it. So if the location data is valid, then it is going to go get a string with the latitude and longitude. And it's going to build it up into this string that we define over here called GPS data. And then this function will return the string, assuming it's completely valid. Now, 
on this string line, you'll notice that I have a six at the end over here. And the reason for that is I'm converting the longitude and latitude, which are longs, into a string. And if you don't put a value back over here, which is an optional value you can put in, it's only going to return back two decimal points. And I want all six decimal points, so you need to do that. And I'm putting a comma between each because I'm making a comma delimited string. If the value isn't any good over here, I'm going to end by returning a zero and that's true for all of the time and date values as well we return a zero if it isn't valid so we don't end up getting any invalid data to write to the SD card assuming the date is valid I go and get the year the month and the day and you'll notice that if the month and day are a value that is under 10 I pad it with a preceding zero so that everything formats nicely and then I put a space between the date and the time and then after that, I go and get my time. I look to see if the time is valid. I do the same thing over here if the value is under 10. I pad it with zero. And I send back the hour, minute, and second. And I put a colon in between them to format it like time. And assuming we got to the end without having to return a zero because of invalid data, we just returned a completed string. And that's a whole string of our GPS data. So now let's go back up into the loop and see how we use that. We'll start off the loop by writing to our LED and sending it low so we turn it off and then we see if there's data actually available and if there is good data available we go and look and see if we got a zero back if we didn't get a zero back then we go into here and we get the GPS string and assign it to the GPS text so we call our function and it returns a string of data that we assigned to this variable we defined earlier as a string then we go and check our counter. Now I am going to get every 30th count the way that I set up my DTS count earlier in, in the program. And so we look to see if we've we've arrived at that total and if we have then we go into here and we turn the LED on high and say we're about to write to the SD card and we open up a file called gpslog.csv and we open it for writing now if the file doesn't exist it will create the file if it does exist it will append to the file and that's something you should make note of because if you turn this off and on it won't overwrite the old file it'll append to it and keep on going and you could read design that if you wanted to. A neat way to do it might be to make another function just to get the GPS date stamp and put it on the file name so that you can put a time date stamp and make unique file names. But I'll leave that up to you. Right now we're just creating a file called gpslog.csv that we're going to continually write to. So if the file is actually open then we'll do a data file print lin which is like a serial monitor print lin but in this case it actually prints out to the file and we'll print the content of GPS GPS text, which is the line of data we want, and then we will close that file. We'll also print it out to the serial monitor for debugging and also tell the serial monitor if we had an error over here. Assuming everything went okay, we're going to increment the GPS count, but make sure that we haven't exceeded the total count. And if we have, we'll set everything back to zero and then go back to the top and run the loop again. And so that will get all of the GPS data spaced out onto every 30th reading in my case for our entire trip. So let's go and take our GPS logger out for a walk and see what it looks like. So here's my little GPS logger and I've just put it onto a sawdless breadboard as you can see. Now uh, you might notice this yellow wire going over here. It actually has nothing to do with the circuit. It's literally holding the Arduino down to the breadboard. Another way of doing that might have been to use double-sided tape, but I figured if I used double-sided tape, then I'd probably ruin the breadboard. Otherwise, you can see the uh, SD card module back over here, and the GPS unit itself, and you probably can't see it, but I've got a couple of little pieces of wire over here just holding down the cable for the GPS unit. You'll also notice I've mounted it so the antenna side is up, and you'll see my LED over here. And over here I've got a couple of different ways I can power it. This is the way I'll probably use uh, out in the field and it's just a 9 volt battery that can plug into the Arduino's power plug. But I've also got this little um, 5 volt adapter, this USB power bank that can plug into the USB connector on the Arduino. So I could power this up either way when I'm taking it out into the field, which is what I'll do right now. I'll go outside and walk around and we'll grab some readings. 
Alright, I've taken my GPS logger out for a stroll, and I have collected some data in this CSV file, and I've just moved it onto my computer into a folder in my Documents folder. Now, before we work with it on Google Maps, let's just take a look at the inside of this file. So we can go open, and it'll open in a spreadsheet, which in my case is LibreOffice. I'm going to open it for display, and it wants to know how it should format it, but it already sees the correct format. It's using a comma as a delimiter, and it's sees three different columns, which is exactly what we've recorded. So we can say OK and take a peek at this file. And over here we have the latitude and longitude and the date stamp that we made uh, for every entry. And as you can see, I started off at 1521. Now remember that's GMT, so because of daylight savings, I'm actually about six hours earlier than that. And I went and I saved 398 lines of data till 1547. So it looks like I spent about uh, 26 minutes or so uh, on my little stroll. So uh, I've got all the different waypoints. Now you may see occasionally where it doesn't look like it lines up, but that's only because the last character would have been a zero. So you'll see that occasionally. And LibreOffice just isn't going to print the zero after a decimal point that doesn't see the point in it. So I'm going to take that off and now I'm going to go into my Google Maps. Okay, so I'm in Google Maps, and I'm going to go to the menu over here. I'm going to Your Places, and in Your Places, I'm going over to Maps, and I'm going to go to See All Your Maps. And there's a button that you'll see right up here that says Create a New Map, so that's what we want to do. And we can give our map a title if we want to, and this is my, uh, my test map. And you can add a description or something. I won't bother to do that right now. And I'm going to import a layer. And so I hit import. And I have to select the file. And I'm going to my CSV file, which I've got in my documents folder here. I'm going to open the CSV file. It's going to upload it. Now it wants to know what these columns mean. So the first one over here is my latitude. And the second one over here is my longitude and then we hit continue and then it needs a label and we're going to use a timestamp as the label and hit finish and let it load and here we go and here's my walk and I went to a park called Centennial Park that has a fake lake or it's actually really a fake big pond it's not really that large and I can zoom in over here you can see where I started my walk over here and so for every one of these points over here I'll get the longitude latitude and a timestamp and it followed the path pretty well. There's a couple of places where it's off. Now that could be that the map is off. It could also be that this area over here was quite treed and there are a lot of treed areas over here. But otherwise it definitely stayed within the three meters that the accuracy is supposed to be. And as I said some of the areas were quite heavily wooded. I also went off the path over here up a bit of a hill to a lookout and you can see that I got a lot of mapping points over here. Sometimes you can see one going up and down like here's one that was at 1530 and the one next to it was at 1533 so one of them was up and one of them was going down the hill so it tracked me pretty well around this park over here I was fairly pleased that I got this kind of resolution and it tracked me when I was coming back past the chalet I actually did cut across the grass over here but after all it is a park you're allowed to do that and I got back to my car over here and that's a pretty accurate representation of where I parked as well so I would say that our GPS logger is uh, working pretty well and this is a way we can view our data on Google Maps. So that wraps up our look at satellite positioning systems for today, but it's certainly not the last time that you're going to be seeing GPS units here in the DroneBot workshop. In fact, I've got two projects coming up that make use of GPS units, including that very expensive and very sophisticated SparkFun unit that I showed you at the beginning of the video. Now, of course, the best way to find out about those videos is to be subscribed to the channel. So if you aren't a subscriber yet, please do me the honor of subscribing. All you'll need to do 
of course, is click on the subscribe button and also click on that little bell notification. And as long as you've got notifications enabled on your YouTube, you will get notified every time that I make a video. Now, if you want to grab some of the code that I used today or learn a little bit more about satellite positioning systems, just head over to the complimentary article on the dronebotworkshop.com website. And you'll find the link to that article right below this video. When you're on the website, of course, you could subscribe to the newsletter if you haven't. It's just my occasional way of letting you know what's going on. I've been a little bit slack about sending them out, but I'm trying to do better. And finally, if you want to discuss today's video, the absolute best place on the planet to do that is on the DroneBot Workshop forums. We've got a bunch of great people there who can help you out with your projects and who love to talk about this stuff. And there's a link below the video so that you can sign up for the forum as well. So until we meet next time, please take care of yourself and please stay safe and we will see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now. Bye.